On this episode, we chat with restaurateurs Jarrett Risley and Charlie Cater about the F&B biz in Bangkok. So if you want some great behind-the-scenes info on operating a restaurant in normal and COVID times, you'll love this episode of the Bangkok Podcast. Sawadi Krap, and welcome to the Bangkok Podcast. My name is Greg Jorgensen, a Canadian who came to Thailand in 2001 to learn how to cook Thai food, but realized that everyone here already cooked Thai food really good, so I just concentrated on eating. Probably a good idea. And I'm Ed Knuth, an American who came to Thailand on a one-year teaching contract 20 years ago, fell in love with using 37 tiny, super-thin napkins with every meal <laughs> I ate, so I never left. And yes, Scott, I know that I should have said cooked Thai food really well. Don't send me an email. (laughs) We want to say a quick thank you to one of our patrons, Dr. Eugene Borquin, who supports us at the show shout out level. Stick around after our interview with two very well-known local restaurateurs to hear why Dr. Borquin is our key to finally getting some real life spiritual guidance on the podcast. And a huge thanks to all of our patrons who support the show. Patrons get a whole bunch of cool stuff, including our regular show a day early, behind-the-scenes photos and videos of our interviews, discounts on swag, which you can find on our website, and various other things that aren't available to regular listeners. But best of all, patrons like Eugene also get an unscripted, uncensored bonus episode every week where we riff on current events and random topics. Uh, We just finished recording this week's bonus show, and we chatted about... WAP, yes, that WAP, and how the more Greg hears about Western pop culture, the happier he is being in Thailand. Ed's 24-hour internet outage, uh, an inspiring speech that a student protest leader gave, and whether or not foreigners can or even should get in trouble simply by observing a protest in person. To become a patron, head to bangkokpodcast.com forward slash support. Right on. Okay, well, on this episode, we are jumping right into a topic that I've wanted to discuss for a long time, and that is the restaurant biz in Bangkok. Now, I'm joined for this interview by Jarrett Risley and Charlie Cater, two of Bangkok's most well-known restaurateurs and the recipients of multiple awards and recognitions from the F&B industry. Uh, Among the restaurants they own are Soul Food Mahanakon, 100 Mahaset, Pepina, Appia, and Surface, among others which any fan of good food in Bangkok has undoubtedly heard of. So I sat down with Jared and Chali to talk about the restaurant industry in general, how they deal with staffing and cultural issues, sourcing food, the business behind booze, and of course the difficulties in running a business that relies on large crowds in the middle of a global pandemic. Great sitting down to talk with these two dudes. So here is my interview with Jared and Chali. All right, well, we are upstairs here in a very famous place that many people have heard of and eaten at. Uh, I know I have. Uh, it's, it's Soul Food Mahanakon on Tong Law. We have beers. We have water. We're set. So <laughs> I'm very lucky to be joined by two uh, very well-known people in the restaurant business in Bangkok, uh, uh, Jared and Charlie. That's about all I know at this point. I, I know Jared a little bit more than I know you, Charlie, but please go ahead and introduce yourselves and uh, tell us who you are and what you do. All right, I'll go first. Uh, my name is Charlie Carter. Uh, I've been, well, living, born and raised in in, 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 in Thailand, in Bangkok. Um, right now I'm doing about four restaurants around town. Um, the latest one we've done is probably 100 Mahaset. Um, we've done a new um, location now in Ekamai. The first location is in CPI area near Chirankung. And then before that, we also have a small pie shop at the Commons called Holy Moly. Um, a shabu place at um, Portugal, um, and also we have what else do we do? Okay, we have a small beer place on Lang <laughs> as well. That's not going to be changed to a diner. We're about to open that probably in a month's time. Yeah. All right. So you got a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Not too much maybe. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Jarrett Risley. I was born in Pennsylvania uh, in a town called Allentown. 
Um, I moved to Bangkok about 11, 12 years ago, and I opened Soul Food Mahanakon. We've been open now for about 10 years. I also uh, operate a place called Appia with my business partner, Paolo, and a pizzeria called Pepina. Uh, recently uh, opened a place called Giglio, although I, I don't have much to do with it except that uh, my business partner, Paolo, uh, runs it, and I'm a small part of that restaurant as well. So working in about uh, four different places in Bangkok, we have a smaller version of Soul Food at the Commons on the same street. And one in Hong Kong that I work with with Black Sheep restaurants. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah. So, but this is a, this is a triple a triple show tonight. We got two guests and one one host. And I, I, I've I've been thinking about getting doing a restaurant <clears throat> themed show for a long time, but um, it's sort of become a bit a bit more on the minds of people right now because Bangkok is obviously known the world over for its food. Um, in the past decade or so, I would say the fine dining uh, has 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 increased a lot i would say the palates of thai people are expanding a lot more and getting uh introduced to a lot of a lot more international flavors than they used to i might be wrong there we can talk about that but um with this covid stuff uh the restaurant industry is taking a huge hit among among other things and uh i just kind of wanted to hear what it's like on the inside for you guys first of all i want to get an idea of what the restaurant industry is like and what noobs that walk off the street like myself <laughs> don't know about the restaurant industry and what you wish we knew. And uh, I also know that there's a lot of back and forth over how the recovery after COVID is going to take place. And the uh, dining scene is obviously a big part of that in Bangkok. So let's start with the obvious. I'm some jackass off the street. I walk into a restaurant. I want to eat, pay, leave. What don't I know about that? Is, is that, is that all you expect? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think uh, speaking from an in industry perspective, you know, there's there's lots of different diners and there, you know, there's different segments and different segments have different expectations about what they what they perceive makes a restaurant work. Right. I think there's a lot of people that think that restaurants are making lots of money and are really expensive. But in fact, it's probably has one of the worst margins of any industry really uh yes i mean a restaurant a healthy restaurant operates at a maybe what five to eight percent margin of profits at the end yeah. of the day after tax and everything yeah you're probably walking away with if you're lucky with 10 percent. you know even though like everybody says yeah it's 30 percent on food costs and blah blah but they don't realize how much else it is that we have to um pay for on a daily basis just to run the place keep the place running keep it going month to month there's a lot of expenses that goes on that's why during the covid era or the three four months of covid we've uh, experienced a lot of hurt and a lot of pain and a lot of restaurants been closing down because you know yeah. you can't sustain it yeah and that number that that five percent or eight percent or charlie said ten percent let's just say between five and ten percent that is operating on the assumption that you're full mm-hmm Okay. Right. If you're not full, you're not making a ten percent margin. <laughs> right. You're losing money. What What else do you have to worry about besides staff, electricity, and food, and rent? Yeah. Um, I think I'm just making sure the the thing about having a steady amount of customers coming through every day. I think is a really important thing. Yeah. Um, we have we assume on fees and feasibility that it's going to do that, like just what Jared just said. If we don't do that, there's a lot of wastage that can happen. You know, we're always on a guessing game, right? Um, that's why these days there's more introduction to um, um, chefs' tables, um, so they, they can gauge right away. I'm, I'm going to have ten seats. I'm going to only um, allow ten people in, and I'm pre-selling these tickets, right? For us being like the the, the old school sort of restaurants, yeah, conventional, you know, restaurants. conventional restaurants. <laughs> right. We're just there and we're playing the guessing game. We're almost fishing. We're going like these days, we're going out fishing because we don't know for sure if the numbers are going to be like it was pre COVID or not. And since we've opened, it's been up and down. It's been riding on a thin line for some days as well. It's been down to maybe like one or two people just visiting the restaurant. So it keeps it hard for us to put. Produce into rotation, ingredients in rotation, menus yeah. in rotation, staff into rotation. All these things matter to us. And then, and then sometimes once 
these things are not consistent anymore and, and, and the income is not consistent anymore, we have to do a lot of guessing. And a lot of guessing is not good for, for, for any business. No. Yeah. Right, right. I guess it's hard to plan more than yeah. a couple of days ahead, yeah. right? You never yeah. know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. Th- just to expand on what he said, we're fishing and there's a hell of a lot less fish yeah, yeah. than there used to be because uh, if you take a city like Bangkok, which has one of the most vibrant restaurant scenes in the world, I think, at all levels, you know, from street food to mid-range restaurants to fine dining, we have everything. However, that was really dependent on a healthy economy and extremely busy tourism sector. Right. And... And just just people moving around. So, you know, not only do we not have the tourists, but we also don't have the part time residents from Singapore, from Hong Kong, from China and from the Middle East. So so what you're looking at is a city like that used to be populated with tens of thousands of tourists and visitors per day going to zero overnight. So if you were, a na- there's a lot of neighborhood restaurants that don't need tourists and don't need visitors. Mm. However, in the mid- or middle and upper level segment of the restaurant industry, you really depend on people who are going for special occasions, who are on vacation. You know, people come to, if, a, people, if someone from Singapore goes to 100 Mahaset, they have no problem spending 5,000 baht or 6,000 baht on dinner. But someone who lives around the corner is not going to, is not going to do the same thing. Right. So... So we've been forced to make this instant adjustment that is, uh, well, you can't in- adjust instantly. I mean, it's really confusing. So we're all just trying to figure out what the hell's going to happen. Yeah. Honestly. You know, I've talked on the show before about, like, I live on the other side of the river in Tonbury, close to Icon Siam. Mm-hmm. And Icon Siam is a mall built for wealthy tourists, for Chinese yeah. tourists. It's not built for the locals. The locals can't afford to shop there. No. I'm a local. I can barely afford to yeah. shop there. Um, and, you know, they must, you know, when that suddenly that tap is turned off, what do you do? Where do you go? What are your options? Like, you can't drop the price of everything. And once the tourist thing has gone away, we have to find that missing gap. Yeah. And how are we going right. to make everybody understand this, you know, and, and make everybody appreciate the good Thai ingredients that we're trying to promote and trying yeah. to sell as well? Is that just marketing? Is it an advertising campaign? Is it word of mouth? Is it I grabbing people it, by the neck and shaking them? Yeah, <laughs> shaking the shit out of them. I think it's, 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 it's many things, you know, I mean, and especially in this time right now, we've seen, we see like, you know, the, the, the expensive restaurants are still packed, uh, the, 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 the chef tables um, that, that are serving food, they're still packed. The Japanese restaurants that are doing omakase for like 10 grand a head, they're still packed. So we see there is a spend. The spending power is there. It's just how they're choosing to spend it. Mm. You know, the masks are going to obviously go back to the brands they're, they're, they trust. They're going to go to the mall brands. They're going to hit that first. They're going to go to MK. Out. Yeah, or, they'll do that. Even yeah. I would do that. I'm yeah. like, you know, I missed this. I'm going to go and right. get sure. my hot pot. and it's comfort and, food. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I know where my money is going to give me right away in yeah. my head. Yeah. Sure. I'm not going to be Avengers today yet. Right. Right. Until that time comes, maybe in two, three months, because the tourists are not going to come back to, I, th- I think, next Q3, which is next, next October or September even. I think for now, we just have to find a way to, to persuade them to try new things or to, to give other brands out there that, were, you know, that are doing um, some really, really neat things with, with, with local products a chance as well. And not just you know, shit on them all the time or, or, or not no. give them a chance. <laughs> And I mean, local products are beautiful. The, the, the thing that, that Charlie said is, is really true. When you, you know, Thailand, ha- is, Thailand has so many beautiful local products from fresh coconut cream, you know, beautiful palm sugar, great beef. Don't forget those nice uh, frogs chickens. that rub and stick down their back. and they <laughs> The frogs on yeah. Khao San Road. Classic. <laughs> those are awesome. <laughs> no, but I, there, I mean, there's so many beautiful things that you can't get here. And, and especially you realize it when you try to recreate Thai food in places outside of Thailand, how bad the products are that are available. But, all but it's just people value it more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But people here take it for granted. Um and yes, to get people to appreciate what's in their own backyard, I think you really need to cook it in, an, in a special way. And part of it is marketing. I think you've done a really good job with the beef. 
he's sourcing all this great beef from from Isan, uh, mostly Wagyu crossbreeds and stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and Wagyu from Isan. Yeah. yeah. So basically, you know, you can obviously you can buy all the 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 breeds that like you can import the breeds first, and then they will have to do the the breeding here, and then and it depends on how they would mix breed them or or keep them as um, high quality as possible. And it's 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 still such a new um, wait, a new thing that they're doing. It's only been let's say in the last twenty, not even twenty years, that they've been experimenting with 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 these sort of uh, breeds to come crossbreed with local cows or with um, the retired dairy um, cattle or, or Brahmin and cattle stuff like that. So it's almost a hit and miss. You know, in the past 10 years for getting Thai beef and everybody says, yeah, Thai beef is good sometimes and it's inconsistent, blah, blah, which is true because they're just still on the verge of getting there. So that's right, why okay, we're going right. to get like we're going to go out to Villa. We're going to buy local beef. We're going to one right. day is going to be, wow, it's so good. And then like next time you go by there, like, why is it so bad? You know? <laughs> Thai, Thai French is like that. Like yeah. sometimes you can go get a beautiful piece of beef yeah. there and then the next day it's shit. It's yeah, just yeah, terrible. yeah, yeah, exactly. And, yeah, so the, everything's right. not consistent, and but now it's starting to come uh, come come through, and then and, and people are starting to realize their population of cows that they hold in their on their farms. They know exactly what they need to do now. Back in the day, they were just right. gonna, I'm just going to breed with that. This we're just going to experiment everything, but it takes you three years to realize you you messed up. You right, know? right. It's right? not overnight. Yeah, it's not overnight. It's not like uh, I'm going to plant this. I'm going to know by three, four months, six months. Yeah, it takes three years until you cut up, you slaughter it, and you actually taste it. Like oh, okay, this didn't work. You know, yeah, you keep on going. So in a, in, a, in a matter of a decade, you're going to get three chances. Wow, yeah. Right? If you really do it right, if you have the money, you can probably push it to every year trying to do something, but then you're going blind in every time. It's come a long way from yeah. that dude mixing yeah. pea plants and figuring out, like, you know, <laughs> yeah. over several weeks, yeah. oh, you mix exactly. these two and it gets yeah. this. So now it's it's coming through, and then, and I'm, I, need, I just, you know, we're getting some of the best beef we've ever gotten, um, I think, in the history. And I think it's getting better and better. Some of the beef that's here is exported direct to Japan nowadays. Nobody knows really? about this. Yes. Really? Yeah, yeah. It's going straight. It's just uh, slaughtered, packed, boom, out they, or out in carcasses in Japan, too. Are they like saying that it's no, Thai? no, really? And then they're gonna send it out there, and they're gonna say it's Thai. Yeah. Oh, Not like sometimes when you get the prawns, the tempura prawns that are really perfect in the yeah. states. Yeah. They'll say um, product of Thailand, yeah, uh, yeah. packed in Japan. <laughs> you know? Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. For the tempura stuff that goes straight to the su- the, sure, the sure. good restaurants, you know, right? You'll find that. So it's the same thing. I think you know we have it, but see, we don't see the we don't see the the, the that we have this great ingredient. We don't people care don't about it. People don't respect the value yeah. of it. So once yeah. people don't respect the value, they don't give. They're not going to pay for it. So why should I sell it to you where you're going to give me? You know, fifty baht for it when I can get a hundred if I just send it away. Yeah, That's like, uh, like the. But when I opened this restaurant ten years ago, before I did that, I was doing a lot. I was sourcing stuff, and I found this group of farmers in Isan, uh, in Yasoton, and uh, like they, they were they're all these, they're all ex communists that kind of moved to <laughs> Yasoton after seventy six because the government was trying to like hunt them down, right? Uh, and they have a cooperative where they grow organic rice. They're kind of like hippies, you know, like listen to clergy wit and, yeah, yeah. and shit like that. And and uh, I I went. Th- they were very confused that I was there. Like, why are you here? What are you doing? And I just wanted to buy rice from them. And they they, they I still buy rice from them. They're they're, they're my rice supplier. Uh, this guy named uh, Paul Bunsong. But all their rice goes to Sweden, except here. Really? Yeah, hundred percent of it. Wow. Because they can sell it for like four times more. No doubt, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's like, you, we'll give it to you, but we're sending the rest to Sweden. Yeah. And they only sell to Sweden because they have some and weird and connection. That's not the only story. I mean, we have a history of doing rice that's sent straight to Japan just to make sake. And some of the best prefectures in, 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 in the world that make sake. Some of the rice and the rice strains come from us, you know, and it's still like that. We're exporting rice to Japan just to make sake as well. Yeah. So we have all these really good ingredients. It's just never appreciated. No one's going to pay the price for it. And if someone else sees the value in it, of course, it's going to appear somewhere else. And we're, we might be the last to know, but it's just, you know, right next door to us. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, I think I think a lot of industries have this the problem of educating the consumer about what they're actually getting and what goes into it. Yeah. You know, years ago, I was working at this um, in this in this company that did made videos for um, uh, logistics companies. 
Mm. And one guy was like, yeah, I want this. I want to make a corporate video and I want, you know, a helicopter shot doing this and I want to do this and, and uh, you know, all these cool effects and special effects. I want renders of ships coming in and out of the port. And we're like, all right, yeah, we can do that. So we sent him the bill and I, I don't know what the numbers were, but for, 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 for ease, ease sake, I'll say, you know, it was a million bot. Yeah. And the guy was like, oh, my God, I was expecting like 50,000 bot. Like, dude, that won't even pay for the gas for the helicopter. You want all these sweeping shots of, you know, yeah. <laughs> like he just had no idea. And we educated him on the cost. And he was like, oh, OK, I can't do this, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so it's always a challenge because it, it, and it's not, not anyone's fault. I, I don't think you can expect uh, a non X industry person to know X about, you know, to know about X industry. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, but I think it's also come to a point where a lot of people have have come back to to find actually a lot of restaurateurs, a lot of chefs. A lot of uh, companies, even a lot of corporations, have come back and find value in local products. And now, with everybody's help and, and and everybody's doing, I think people are starting to realize slowly, but still, the people that are, are using the really good products that we have are still going to have to sell it at a price that's a bit higher. So the first people that are going to actually come try it are the people that can afford it or sure give. Mm something about you know yeah but like give a damn about it so and then you know we're not this is not going to be customers that are going to come back every week or every no now. they're going to come back and come and try and like you know hey i tried it you know but you know it's, it's that and you know there's also this perception unfortunately Ch- charlie and i have thai restaurants we have other restaurants yeah. too <laughs> but if you if you sold just okay i can sell 200 grams of thai beef here in a in a in a in a nam tol like in a grilled piece of beef for 350 baht and you can go across the street and the Japanese restaurant can sell the same cut of beef from Thailand or Australia uh, for 350 baht for a hundred grams and it's not cooked. People have to cook it and people will still say, why is your beef so expensive? And they'll go across the street and they'll cook it themselves there's half as much and, and they're they totally cool with it they're fine with it they're like yeah that's great that was delicious <laughs> that's and interesting yeah, it comes back to the perception of, of of who's packaging it for you you know who's who's, who's right where where is where where is it going to be and they have been able to add that value for a long time and people have been willing to pay it for it for a long time which is kind of sad that we can't do it <laughs> you know let's just keep trying yeah. so <laughs> Speaking of how things are changing, can you talk a little bit about how the tastes of Thai people have changed over the past decade or so? I'm going to give that to Charlie. Cause... What, are, what are they looking for? What are they expecting? If it's with local foods or with, with Thai food, I think they're looking for stuff they have not seen. You know, they're not everybody's bored of this to curries. Even the foreigners are bored of the, the normal the nine curries that we see on the menus all the time. So they want to see new ingredients. They want to try new things. They want to. They want to. They want us to open their eyes too, and then show me something new. Show me something I haven't seen. And there's a lot from history, and also from 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 Thai culture, and also from Thai normal like recipe cookbooks that we have not seen yet because people haven't eaten them for a while, and we don't have the people. Nobody grows some of the stuff as well, so it's hard to find some of those things. But I think that's one of the things that I've been seeing lately of late. That people want to try new things or more traditional things, very deeply rooted recipes that are hard to find now, you know, or you have to just go way forward to the future and then make them confused and tell them how to eat things. So you have two <laughs> ways you know, to do this, yeah. right? Yeah. You go really deep into the roots of the recipe and then you show the real, the real thing, the, what, what it used to be like, or you just skip to the future and then bring it back. Right, a couple of years. I think that that's been uh, that's been the change from from a restaurant point standpoint, and also from a consumer standpoint. I think that's what they want, and that's what they want to consume and to to see and, and and to take in. Is it kind of like the old adage, like people don't know what they want until you tell them? Yeah, it could be. I think so. You know, especially in in terms of foreign food. I mean, when it comes to Thai food, it's a little bit different because it's it it's their cuisine and. Everyone has an opinion on what's right and what's wrong and what's good and what's bad. But especially like when they go to Appia, for instance, you know, if I go to the table or especially Paolo and says, you know, and you say, hey, you should try this. We just brought this from Italy. Like people will order it. Yeah. You just bring that accent on and people order it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, <laughs> you should try. But, but no, but really, I mean, pe- 
there, pe- people are very willing to to try things that they've never tried before, but only if you tell them why they should try it. Otherwise, they will just order lobster. Yeah. Or steak. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, <laughs> like, and that's yeah. that's 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 true yeah. to everything. Yeah. Keep, when any, when you give someone a menu that has thirty items, and let's say you want them to eat this new stuff you've done, this stuff you've discovered, or they brought like they just uh, imported some really good product, and fifteen of them is just too confusing and too intimidating to read. There's no pictures to it. So like right? the last five times so, I had this yeah, one dish, I'm exactly, gonna have that yeah, again. I'm just gonna good. yeah, I'll do the ragu. Again, <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and then you never get a chance to try a new thing. But then, that's true. I mean, we have to go back to the days, like the old school days, where the the, the patrons of the restaurant come out, greets every table, make sure they can pass on the energy that they want to pass on to to the tables. Because right. a lot of it gets lost with you know sometimes we don't train our staff well enough, or also the intimidation of the staff that they have here to engage with yeah. with, with 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 the customers as well. And, you know, we can't lie about it no matter what we say. We do have a caste system. Even people say we don't, but we do. You know, we will not see someone of a low caste. I don't want to sound, you know, really like sensitive or anything about it. But it's true. They have a fear to engage sometimes. And sometimes if you're sitting there in a really expensive table and you don't give a shit and it makes them not want to engage with you because it's just is a disconnect right away right. and it's an awkwardness right away that someone's trying to tell you to eat something or and then they're just not caring and this happens all the time we can see it happen and that also comes back to my point that we as the owners or the patrons need to come out and express themselves and especially in this covid era we need to do that more and more for to sell our products to make them believe that's one of the things that I've I've sort of seen too, and it surprised me when I realized it was how much of the personality and the the atmosphere of a restaurant comes from the staff and the owner. And mm. there's been several restaurants that I've really liked in the past, and the head chef or the owner has sold it or moved on or whatever, and it's just not the same. It's not what I what I came to love. And I was surprised that it like you think, oh, I go to this restaurant because food is good, but there's so much more to it than that. And I think people don't realize it. So a lot of people may not realize it. I certainly didn't. I mean, I, I love food, and I would like to think that people come to my restaurant, my restaurants because of the food. But really, it's it's far more complicated than that. It's a you know, it's a combination of of atmosphere. Uh, it has to be clean. Um, the attitude, the general attitude of the staff, uh, miserable staff are re- like front of house staff really make me never want to go back to a restaurant. Totally. Like yeah. it's the number one thing. Even if the food is delicious, if they treat you like shit, you don't want to go back. Except, for, Gonz- except for Gonzado. I always go back to that restaurant, <laughs> and I love it. I hope you're listening, Gonzado. Uh, I love you, but they treat me like shit. Um, <laughs> they have some of the best cows available to them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, no, but I mean, it, it, I think the general sort of attitude is, is a, you know, restaurants are, are, are definitely a reflection of the people that own and operate them. Yeah. Operate them. Forget about the own part. But um, if you go to a place that, where the where the owner is never there and where it's sort of Lord of the Flies kind of scenario. And there are a lot of restaurants like that, especially here, I would say. Um, especially mainly the chain, like the franchises that are brought in from abroad, I think are especially weird. But, you know, if there's no sort of guiding principle of behavior, then things are usually go right. wrong. Right. Things usually go wrong. It's, yeah, It has to be a reflection of, of the owner or whoever is running the place at the time. Or the chef, um, either or, because the, they can control the tempo of the whole room. They can control the the vibes of the whole room. Sure. And every, it's like an artist trying to 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 draw up something. They have to connect with you on some level, you know. And a lot of times, if you would have to have someone else explain what your art is or what your art is trying to do or to, to convey, of of course, it's gonna get lost. No one knows that the piece right. is act like you. So I think having the owner there or whoever is there in charge to have a focus and also to keep up the reputation and the vibe of the place is, is, is one of the most important things in, in a restaurant. One of the uh, interesting aspects is, and, and this is something that um, a friend of mine, you probably know him too, former guest of the show, Dan Fraser, smiling albino. Yeah, sure. Uh, owner yeah, Dan. And runner. Um, he's, he's talked a lot about how difficult it is for him to find guides for his tour company because it's not like anyone can take the TAT course and learn like, Oh, the democracy monument is 200. More yeah. um, but it's so much more than that. And you've got to have that right personality it's got to snap you've got to know how to deal with people so what 
what are the challenges in in hiring staff? How do you break someone out of that that like lethargy that causes the customers to go? Ugh. I'm gonna let Charlie uh, answer this question. <laughs> you gonna, you gonna, you're gonna go off on a rant? Yeah. No, I don't. I don't know. I don't know the answer. To that. So basically, I think um, sometimes it's really hard to come by to come by staff. So you 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 feel like okay, fine, um, you worked here, and I'll just take you in, and we'll we'll try to we'll try to train you to to get there. Can you generally do that? Break someone yeah, down and build I'll, them up again? Well, sometimes and a lot of times you just can't. You know, I mean, you can't really you change people, and sometimes you can't really make people confident. You know, and a lot of times. The confidence is always the lacking thing that we have as 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 us um, as ties. We're very conservative. We're, uh, we don't rock the boat. We try to go with the flow right. a lot of times, and that's reflective of, of of everybody's personality. Like majority, you know, I'm not saying everyone. And if you do rock the boat and you're loud in everyone, everybody looks at you like, "What's wrong with this person?" Right mm-hmm. away, you know. Not we we're, we judge right away. We have that perception in us, so it makes it hard for us. To make someone confident, to engage, and to try to tell people and to 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 educate people or try to tell them just the menu. So, in return, we try to keep as simple and as as possible. I've been lucky with mine that that a lot of my front of house staff know the food I'm trying to serve because it's Thai food mixed with uh, some Isan produce ingredients. So it's for them. They have the confidence to go there because they see it all the time. Like if it was like for our let's say for Apia or something, I would be scared sometimes to, to have to hire someone because they have never eaten these, the, some of these dishes. Yeah. It's always going on rotation. It's always new. They didn't grow up with this. That was more, right. that, that will freak you out a little more. Like, how am I going to tell this person that this is it? But for me, they grew up with this lab. They, they know better than me how this lab was supposed to be. Yeah. You know, so they, they have the input for it and they have, they can go right away on, 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 on the spot. But if something they didn't grow up with, then, I'll give Jared the, the mic, but but it's going to be a bit freaky to actually give them the the the, the conch and go up there and try to make sure, like you know, you have all the answers for these people. You know, right? Yeah, yeah. It is. I mean, it's super tricky. Uh, it, it even starts with the fact that most people that work for us have never ever eaten in a restaurant like they're working in. Right. That must be a huge challenge. like ever in their life. So start there. Um, I've always been really interested about the relationship that a restaurant has with alcohol, um, all kinds of booze, cocktails, et cetera, what have you. I always liken it to the relationship that a movie theater has with popcorn, whereas like that's where they make a good chunk of their money. Is that right? Is it wrong? Am I way off base? What's what's going on behind the scenes? Uh, no, no. It's, I mean, it's absolutely right. I wouldn't say that restaurants make all of their money from alcohol. And some restaurants don't make any because they don't sell it. You know, fast food restaurants, for instance, most of them. However, for restaurants like ours, which have an extremely high food cost, have a high operational cost, carry a lot of staff, and really worry about the product, we make most of our money on alcohol. Really? Most of it? I would say yes, in terms of pure profit, because you don't have, okay, you don't have wastage with alcohol. You put it, you know, you open a beer and, and, and you serve it to someone. Um, restaurants are built on the premise that you can serve alcohol, and it, it's usually between 30 and 50% of your revenue. So when the government decided to allow us to reopen but not sell alcohol, however, let supermarkets and 7-Eleven sell alcohol, it seemed to me like an insidious plot to make <laughs> restaurants just go out of business. Like, I, I simply didn't understand why. Now I understand a little bit better. I mean, I, if, you, if you look at the data with COVID, there have been a, a lot of spreading events that occurred at parties and at bars. But we were not bars and we didn't have parties and we were just trying to survive. So for me, it was infuriating and it still kind of is. But I understand the logic of it a little bit better now than I did before. And looking at the outcome of Thailand's policies with COVID-19, um, I can't really uh, fault them. However, do I think that anything would have changed if restaurants like mine and Charlie's were able to serve alcohol? Absolutely not. Uh, it's not like you're having 50 people in to, to, to no we were out. having like six people in or eight or and the other thing was you know you, you, okay fine you can't serve alcohol in the restaurant but you could buy it takeaway and, and drink a beer on the street and eat the same thing it didn't make any sense right okay there was no it was it was policy that was harming us in a great in, in you know in a, a great deal 
and didn't really seem to make sense to me in a mechanical way. But the other thing is I can't complain now because our restaurants are open and half the world or most of the world restaurants are still closed in large cities. Yeah, I mean, um, I think, um, I think they took the right decisions to do it. Although, you know, at, at, at a really expensive cost for us, you know, and for, for a lot of people in this, in this, in, 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 in this country, but I also feel like the decisions they've made have really resonated in a good way. I think, um, as put good outcomes, I don't know, maybe they realize that, you know, as, us being ties, we're not that responsible to drinking yet. <laughs> <laughs> you mean. know, so so that makes it, you know, that, that that I mean once once I mean was I was I unhappy about it? Yeah, of course I was, you know, it takes away a chunk of our money and also it gives us less freedom to be able to have people over for dinner and then have a nice you know have a nice time, I think, and be able to be free. Having like when we started off having like those barricades and no alcohol and Everything had to be put into plastic bags before you ate it. Right. That made it really, really... It was joyless. Yeah, joyless. It made it very plastic. It made it very fake. I mean, like, you know, okay, just come out and just let's try this out sort of thing. So, you know, that was just the... I was. Just, I think that was sad about that bit. But, you know, coming back to re- to look at the whole al- alcohol decision that they have made, I think it's, it is, you know, fair enough to them. Yeah. Yeah. And we were able to drown all of our sorrows... In the alcohol that we weren't selling to yes, other people, obviously, yes, yes, uh, yes. I would call him and and yes. Dylan and Bo and yeah. all of our other friends, and we would just sit and drink the booze. <laughs> sure. Come, come like, over, come up to the second floor. Yeah, <laughs> literally making hard, making hard lemonade out of lemons. I yeah, guess, yeah, yeah, something like that. So, final question then, as as we're wrapping up, and as hopefully COVID nineteen is wrapping up. I mean, I imagine the phrase "social distancing" much must terrify restaurant owners. <laughs> What what's what does the future look like for you guys? What can be done? What will work? What won't work? What are you hoping to see? I think we're all absolutely mortified about the prospect of of a second wave, let's say, in Thailand. Um, I'm if that, you know, straight right off the bat, if that happens, many restaurants will disappear. Right. And, And I think, you know, so. But I also have faith in this in this current government in a way that I didn't before because of the relatively positive way in which they've handled this situation. In the meantime, it's just interacting with the people that we have, right? Yeah, I think so. I think uh, the most it. important thing is the locals will have to support us, you know, and then because we're not going to get any money coming in from abroad. You know, airports are going to be closed to 21 for sure, maybe Q2. Um, they, they might allow people to come in. So right now it's whoever's not going abroad this Q4, this high season to go to a vacation somewhere else to hit the slopes in the cycle, bring that money around, come to us, yeah. come <laughs> to us and spend us. money. Ain't going to snow here, but we'll make yeah. you feel good. <laughs> if you want to have restaurants in the future, you have to go to restaurants yeah, yeah. right now <laughs> because we need, we need everyone's support. And, you know, we go to work every day and our staff go to work every day with the hope and the expectation that people are going to show up and, and appreciate what we do. We need it. I mean, it's, it's what yeah. it's, it's it's, all we it's, got. It's, it's like, you know, we haven't seen the worst of it yet. I'm sure it's going to get worse, um, especially for hotels, especially restaurants that are in hotels as well. Um, a lot of the hotels that are um, paying high rent and not being able to, to, to bag it in yet, they're yeah. going to they're gonna, they're gonna be packing soon as well. So this is just the beginning. I mean, even if we don't get by a second wave of, of the COVID or whatever, it's gonna look bleak for the F and B and the hospitality industry for 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 at least in the next six months. It's gonna get worse and worse. People will be out of jobs for sure. It's a pretty easy ask of everyone though. Like, you wanna be a hero? <laughs> Go out and have a good time and eat some delicious food. Yeah, yes. for sure. You know? Do it. <laughs> eat some delicious food, you know, and then spend some money like you would if you were in Tokyo, if you're in uh, Hokkaido somewhere, if you were down in London, right. you know. You can take pictures there. Come over and take pictures at our place. We'll make it look like London. Yeah. <laughs> I'll even let you stand in the middle of the dining room with lighting. Put a green screen. Do whatever the back. hell yeah. you want. That's exactly. Right. Yeah. But I think we need also for us as restaurateurs and as also business owners, how to give them more in return. I think um, we've overlooked them for a long time. Even though we say like, you know, we sell all local products. We've never actually like, hey, let's 
we need some local local customers in here. You know, um, we've yeah. been depending and banking on foreign customers so much. We actually we haven't given a shit because the money was coming in. Yeah. But you know, we as restaurateurs also need to give back and also need to give like you know it has to be a good entertainment, a good return once they come and once they eat with us. After this, this this whole COVID thing, we can't take it for granted anymore. We can't just say, you know, they'll come. You know, they'll come. Right. Yeah. So it's interesting. That's how it's making you sort of look inward. How you now you have to focus on the relationships with, with people that yeah, you normally yeah, yeah. wouldn't Absolutely. Have to, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. You always do what MK does, make your staff do a dance every hour or something like that. <laughs> hey, that works, you know? He's a distractor for at least right. two minutes, and then they bank so much money by the minutes. So, you know, they, they do good things. With right? boiled vegetables. I might, I might lose some staff if I make them dance. I'm not really sure. Right. Are there laws against that? No, man. That? It's, like we said, it's a two-way street. you got to get up there, too. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks so much for coming on. Any last thoughts? Where can people find you online? If they want more info, uh, we're easy to find. I, you know, I mean, we're all, in the, re- all the we're restaurants. In the restaurants. You, <laughs> you can you can find me at, at Soul Food Mahana Corn or Appia or Pepina. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm around. I'm yeah. easy to find. Just Charlie? Google us. Uh, Hundred Mahaset. Two locations now: one on Akamai, one on the original one on CPR. And you know, um, and especially you know, just not just us. Uh, support wherever you can around you, and then. Whoever's doing good things and, and keep them alive. Keep them alive. Yeah, support yeah. your local restaurants. Support your neighborhood restaurants because yeah, your yeah. neighborhood restaurants are the most important restaurants to you. You know your restaurants and your 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 businesses around you, around your neighbors, make your neighborhood better. I'll tell you what, the last <laughs> yeah. the last thing I need is another uh, another couple inches on my waistline. But you know what? I'm going to do it because I love you guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you very thank much. You. Appreciate it. You know, I, I really don't know anything about the restaurant business, and so this was uh, very educational for me. But I just got to say this. In a city like Bangkok, where there's thousands of restaurants, and I feel as if they come and go very frequently, right? Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's obviously ridiculously competitive. The fact that they've just succeeded in this environment, it means that they're not, they're not your average restaurant owners, no, no, they're they're. I mean, Charlie is Thai, Jared is American, but they're both just super hip, super knowledgeable, very tied into what's going on. Obviously, know the deal, um, and they've done really well. And they're they just kind of serve no bullshit, great food. Um, and I mean, I don't, I don't know what else to say about that. I've eaten at most of their restaurants, and they are all great. Yeah, no, it's great stuff. You know, but it's, you know, starting a restaurant is just one of those things that a lot of foreigners or expats, maybe even our listeners, dream of. But uh, the failure rate's got to be super high. And so uh, getting some education about it uh, is a good idea. I mean, if, if I wanted to open a restaurant here, I don't know, man, I would spend months trying to get advice because I feel like the it's such a competitive environment. The odds have to be stacked against you. Yeah, well, isn't that the the thing, right? Like the most difficult business to open is a restaurant. Like, just I don't know. Uh, I mean, I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, uh, I got to hand it to them for making uh, multiple successes uh, in Bangkok. Uh, it's great. It's fantastic. Yeah, really good talking to them. Really interesting to hear about, you know, the class system that the waiters have to deal with when the, their clients come in and sourcing food and all that stuff. Uh, some sure. good behind the scenes info. So thanks, guys, for sitting down with me. It was great to see you guys. And um, thanks for coming on the show. For sure. Okay, let's jump into Love, Loathe, or Live With, where one of us picks a particular aspect of life in Bangkok, which we then discuss and decide if it's something that we love about living here, loathe about living here, or have come to accept as something that we just have to learn to live with no matter how we feel about it. And this week, Ed, the truth, it is over to you. Okay, I've got something that really annoys me, so I'm just, I'm just, I'm not going to try to hide what I think. I'm, <laughs> okay. I'm a, I'm a loathe. I haven't even said what it is. But I'm already a loathe. Right, you're one uh, of those guys. But, but I'm, yeah, but I'm curious what you think about this, and I, I think it's better for me to keep this general, uh, although I could get specific. But I really think this is endemic. It's like an endemic issue in Thailand, and what it is, Greg, is I feel like there's an excessive use of plastic wrap or like cellophane wrapping around stuff. And it's just, again, I'm, I'm going to keep it very general, but I just feel like I buy a lot of stuff and there's just excessive packaging. 
Yeah. I mean, are you are you with me? It's like two or three layers of stuff where there's like a bag and then a thing and then and then there's like cellophane thing like it's been sealed, like vacuum sealed. And I can't find the edge to tear it off, you know, and it's like I can't open the packages, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, I mean, um, love or live with shouldn't even enter into this because it's just a straight loaf. yeah like there's <laughs> there's a lot of like individually wrapped things that are then wrapped in a package that which are then wrapped in like an yes. outer package yes okay so okay so you're on you're you get where i'm coming from here yeah yeah it's, it's ridiculous it, okay great you know for listeners again if uh I, I know a lot of our listeners have been to thailand or been to asia and i don't know if the, maybe some of our listeners uh, know better than i do i don't know if this is just an asian thing or if it's a thai thing but it's like Shit is over packaged. It's like two or three layers of plastic. And, you know, the purpose of my rant is that this is just annoying to me, but it's probably bad for the environment, all that plastic. But that's kind of another issue. Well, you know what I was going to say is that is that like my mother-in-law, using her as an example, and I hope she's not typical of like the older generation of ties, although maybe she is. But the amount of plastic this woman is responsible for consuming is overwhelming. <laughs> And it's not her. It's just that she buys a lot of stuff. She's cooking all day. She's buying this and buying and that. And everything is wrapped everything in plastic. Everything, everything is wrapped in multiple layers of plastic. And and just no one seems <laughs> to think about it. It's just like, yeah. oh, I got to buy some plastic bags. Those come in a plastic bag. Maybe I should buy that six pack of those plastic bags and plastic bags. I'll just pick up this plastic bag of plastic bags <laughs> right, full of plastic bags. You know? right, 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 right. Jesus. It seems Where's you know, I, you know, I, I, I'm guessing there's got to be some... I, there's got to be some kind of cultural foundation for it. I mean, I guess, you know, I, in general, I think Thai people are are very clean people. Like, I, I you know, we, we've talked before about how a lot of Thai people take more than one shower a day, you know, most likely due to the heat and things like that. And Thai people in general are kind of well-dressed, you know. You know what I heard one time that kind of made sense to me, and especially about the older generation, not really understanding the effect and the impact that just all this waste has is that when my mother-in-law's generation grew up as when she was a little girl, everything was wrapped in banana leaves. So you ah. just chucked that away and it was no big deal. Cause it's just a banana leaf, you know, and that ah, sort that, of okay. behavior was That's interesting. Okay. I mean, yeah, maybe, yeah. I'm not sure that explains why everything has to be wrapped in plastic, well, but yeah, but issue, I understand but, your point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Like the, the, they're not worried about just throwing packaging away because in the past it was actually, biodegradable right um you know my annoyance is uh, you know i i buy a lot of gadgets you know electronic stuff and it's it, it just even that stuff which is coming from big companies it's just over sealed i mean maybe uh, you know I, i've been trying to figure it out maybe it has something to do with the fact that there are counterfeit products and things like that and so the you know when you buy something from a proper company they want you to know that it's never been opened dude i bought the an electric toothbrush thing. last week and i nearly cut my arm off trying to open this thing just through the sharp plastic yes, yes. <laughs> it's crazy <laughs> you, know? you could like it's not you know this issue is that there's too much packaging that's one part of the issue but the other part of it is you can't get it off right it's like really it's very difficult like you need you, you really need like a box cutter and scissors right <laughs> It's like shit is sealed, man. Shit is really sealed up. <laughs> I was about ready to think like this thing on fire, which just isn't good for anyone. But it was the only way I could see to open it. But finally it worked. But Jesus. All right. Wow. We are on the same page. Yeah. Double loathe. Double loathe. Excess, that... excess plastic packaging. Yeah. All double plus ungood. <laughs> All right. So as we mentioned at the beginning of the show, we'd like to say thank you to Dr. Eugene Borquin for lending us his support at the show Shadow Level. Greg, what did you find out about Dr. Eugene? Well, this is going to be a particularly a bit of a unique shout out because uh, as you know, Ed, our patrons are absolutely superb people across the board, just perfect ambassadors for all that is good in the world. But I, I would agree. Yeah. But I have to say, I think Dr. Gene beats them all. You know, think, really? Yeah. So he wrote. He's our most good. He's our most good. Our goodest. Some would our say. Best. Some would say bestest. Uh, so our bestest. Dr. Gene wrote to introduce himself. And I got to say, I couldn't write it any better myself. So I'll just read his whole intro because I think all of our listeners would benefit from knowing someone like Dr. Gene. So okay. 
The Reverend Dr. Eugene Borkwin is a native New Yorker who worked for nearly a quarter century at the National Center on Deaf Blindedness in suburban New York. Gene has lectured internationally and nationally on topics related to drivers yielding sign language interpretation and communication and mobility with deaf blind people. He was the first person to earn certifications in both mobility for the blind and sign language interpretation for the deaf. Gene has taught in personnel prep programs at Salas University, North Carolina Central University, Ratchasuda College, and Mahidon University in Thailand. He works regularly with the Northern School for the Blind in Chiang Mai. He resides in New York City and Chiang Mai, Thailand, with his husband Kong, a Thai national. He is ordained clergy in the Episcopal Church and serves as the pastoral missioner to people who are deaf or blind in the 200 parishes and facilities of the Diocese of New York and All Saints, Chiang Mai, the only progressive Christian church in Northern Thailand. So, wow, what a guy. Those are some, those are yeah. some credentials. Maybe someday I'll become a good person. <laughs> So yeah, so Gene sounds like a a pretty good guy, but I got to tell you, Ed, I think I think I can give him a run for the money because I'm going to tell you something. Oh, really? I'm not even. This is true. I'm not even sure you know this, but I actually am also an ordained minister. Hundred percent true. For real? Yeah, I am. What uh, what church? What church are you an ordained minister with? I right? am an ordained minister in the Church of the Latter Day Dude on Dudism dot com, which is a religion built around the Big Lebowski. Oh wow. Yeah, and now this, that's that's serious. I mean, not just anyone can do that. Well, actually, actually anyone can do it. But but uh, oh, th- check this oh, out. Really? This religion was founded by uh, I guess say a buddy of mine, but a guy I once knew named Oliver, who lives in drum roll Chiang Mai, the same city oh. that Doctor Eugene lives in. Excellent. So they're yeah. both ordained ministers. Just one of them with a real church, and the other one with <laughs> with with Dudism. How dare you! How dare you make fun of my religion? This is persecution, Ed. This is what it is. <laughs> Apparently, um, it is. Yeah. But but even even so, I am nowhere near the man that uh, Doctor Doctor Gene is and his contributions to society. So thank you, sir. Thank you. You do good work here and in the states. And thank you for supporting the show because we appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I got. But I also got to say that I'm a little bit uh, shy now because he's a patron. He gets access to our who our uh, bonus shows, and sometimes those can get a little bit blue. So apologies, sir. <laughs> <laughs> All right. A final thanks to our patrons who help keep the show ad free. Patrons get a ton of cool perks and the warm, fuzzy feeling knowing that they're helping support the show. Find out more by clicking support on our website and connect with us online. We're Bangkok Podcast on social media, bangkokpodcast.com on the web, or simply bangkokpodcast at gmail.com. We love hearing from our listeners and always reply to our messages. Right on. You can also listen to each episode on the YouTubes. You can chat with us on the lines or even reach out to me directly on the Twitters where I am BKK Greg. So thanks for listening, everyone. Take care and we will see you next week. Yes, we will. Patrons get a whole bunch of cool stuff, including our regular show a day early, behind-the-scenes photos and videos of our listeners, discounts on swag, which you can find... Wait, wait, you said of our listeners. Oh, did I really? Yeah. (laughs) Of our interviews. Oh, shit. (laughs) Yeah.